morning. morning. Well, as you can see here, we've started our sermon series a couple weeks ago titled Power Over Chaos. And um, I just want to review quickly the first couple weeks. This is our third week, if you have not been here. This is our third week in that. And the first week, if you were here, we introduced the series. And the series was about, or what we talked about in that week was, uh, first of all, we talked about the Trinity. If you're familiar with that term, the Trinity, God being one being with three parts, uh, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. And so this whole series, Power Over Chaos, is about a life lived with the Holy Spirit, a life lived walking by the Spirit. And so we talked about how, we talked about the Trinity, we talked about how God is three in one, and how all three work together as one, not just three individual persons, but that they work together. So you've God the Father and Jesus the Son are, are probably the two easiest to relate to because we, can, as people, can relate to fathers and sons and people and tangible things like that. But the Holy Spirit, that's kind of a different story. You know, if we talk about spirits, we can't, as people, typically relate to that as well as we could uh, a person. And so what, time, what happens a lot of times is we take that and we just kind of put the Holy Spirit kind of over here. I'm all about the God the Father. I'm all about Jesus. But the Holy Spirit, can you hear me? Sets over here on the side. And so what we talked about was how the issues a lot of times that we are seeing in our country Right now, the issues a lot of times that we're seeing in our churches right now is because of that exactly, that we've taken the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, everything that comes with the package of the Holy Spirit, and we've pushed it off to the side because either one, we haven't seen it, two, we don't understand it, three, because we haven't seen it, we don't understand it, we don't want to be responsible for that. And so we talked about how the Holy Spirit is not just like the crazy uncle. He's there, you either choose, some people choose to acknowledge him, some people choose to ignore his existence. The church, it, the, the Holy Spirit is a controversial subject. And that's what we talked about in week one. And we talked about how he is a gift and how if we want to live an empowered life, if we want to live a life with power over chaos, the only way that is achievable is by living with the Holy Spirit. So if we put him over here on the side, we can't live that life. And we just finished a, an entire series on love. And there were a lot of great things in that series, and, and, and I came away from that but like, yes, I want, that's what I want to look like. I want to look like Jesus. I want to look like a walking picture of love. The only way that that happens is a life led by the Holy Spirit, because it's the Holy Spirit who sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts. Otherwise, it's a bad replica. And so that's why this this. this topic of the Holy Spirit is so incredibly important, and we can't afford to just put him off to the side on a shelf, in a box, in a corner, because we don't understand, or we haven't seen things take place like it says in the Word of God. So that's what we talked about in week one. In week two, Pastor Miriam preached, and she talked about our prayer language, and how each of us has a unique prayer language. When we receive the Holy Spirit, when we receive uh, our prayer language from him, it's, it's, our, it's a direct connection to God. We don't, we don't understand what we're praying because the Spirit is making utterance directly to our Father. And how when we, when, if we want to live a life led by the Holy Spirit, part of the way that we grow in that, it, building ourselves up in our most holy faith, is through praying by the Spirit. And we have, if, if we want to grow, if we want to have power over chaos, this is one way that that happens and that takes place. And she talked about that last week. It was really, really good. If you weren't here for either of those, you can go back. I'm not going to go too in-depth. I've already gone further than I wanted to. Um, if you want to go back and go watch that, uh, I would encourage it because there's a lot of really great things in there that I think are very applicable. We're, we're all about the practicality. It's not just theory, but the practicality. And there are things that are so applicable that need to take place in our lives in order for us to see this take place. If we want to live in a life with power over chaos, we can't just know about it. We have to apply it. There's got to be an application. And so I would encourage you to, to, to go back and, and, and watch those, even if you were here, uh, because I'm sure you probably missed some things, because I have to go back and watch it too. Amen? Okay. 
Today we're actually going to dive into the fruits of the Spirit. This is some of my favorites. So let's turn into Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 16. I hope you brought your Bibles with you this morning. Yeah. 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 I'm not in the mood today. All right, we're going to start in verse 16. It says this. This is Paul writing to the church of Galatia. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. If that wasn't a list long enough... (laughs) Things like these. Okay. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, I like that big but right there. All right? But, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against these there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Or I like to say this, I don't believe Paul was, was questioning whether or not uh, he could live by the Spirit. So that word if could also be translated as since. Since we live by the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Walk in step with the Spirit. With, that, was a, that was a very long passage, and, and I actually I want to point out two phrases in that passage. The first of which is works of the flesh. The second of which is fruit of the Spirit. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about works versus fruits right now. Notice that it's not works of the Spirit or fruits of the flesh. That's interesting, right? Works of the Spirit versus fruits of the flesh. Of the flesh, it's, it is works of the flesh, fruits of the spirit. And the word works there implies labor. My work, what am I doing? The things that I'm laboring for, laboring toward, it, 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 it implies a, a strain or an effort. My work, many people would say, yeah, I go to work. That sounds about right. <laughs> labor, effort, bless you. But here's the thing. Our, the fruit does not come from our flesh. Because our old sinful nature can only produce works. In fact, Hebrews tells us that it's dead works. That our, 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 our flesh does not produce fruit. It, our flesh produces works. And those works are dead, according to Scripture. But, here's the cool thing. The Spirit produces fruit, which is living. So, you, are you catching the difference right now? You've got works, which are dead you have fruit, which is living. It's alive, right? So I think it's really important that we recognize that it's not the works of the Spirit or the fruit of the flesh, that we don't get those two things confused. The Spirit produces living fruit, and this is in line with God's plan from the beginning of the world. Let's turn to to Genesis real quick, chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 11. In fact, that's the only scripture we're going to read, verse 11. It says this, And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth, and it was so. So the scripture is telling us that God says, Okay, I want plants, vegetation, fruit trees. You guys are going to produce, and you're going to produce seeds. And not only are you going to produce seeds, those seeds are going to produce fruit and vegetation. So after its own kind. And that's very important. 
What, that, what that's saying essentially is this, an apple produces other apples from its apple seed. Do you get an orange from an apple? No, we know that. So apples produce apples, oranges produces oranges, grapes produce grapes, right? Makes sense. We know this. Each fruit continues to reproduce its own kind. And you know, this is interesting to me, the spiritual sense of this word. If you take and you're talking about fruits in a spiritual sense, not just natural, but in a spiritual sense, the fruit of the Spirit then reproduces fruit after itself. Okay, get this picture. When we live a life led by the Spirit, the fruits that are produced out of that life will then reproduce that same fruit. Love, if I walk in the Spirit, and the fruit of that Spirit is love. My love births love. Because fruits produce seeds. And those seeds, in turn, produce fruits. You see this cycle? This is called sowing and reaping. Okay? So as I go and, and allow the Holy Spirit to work within me and through me and to produce this fruit within me, that fruit then, in turn, is reproduced as seeds that are sown in the life of a believer, in a life of the person who has lived by the Spirit. Those seeds are now sown. I'm sowing love. I'm sowing joy. I'm sowing peace. I'm sowing the fruits of the Spirit out of my life so that now those seeds are planted in others so that the Holy Spirit then begins to produce that fruit within them. Because see, fruits produce fruits, which is life. But works do not. Works are dead. They are not living. Real fruit versus fake fruit. That's what I like to call if, we, if it were the works of the Spirit instead of the fruits of the Spirit. You know, if I held in my hand, I wish I had some right now. Just imagine this hand. I've got a really nice, beautiful, red, delicious apple. Actually, Honeycrisp are probably my favorite. <laughs> but we'll, we'll get, you got the picture of a red delicious. Everybody knows what a red delicious looks like, right? All right, so in this hand, I've got a really nice red delicious apple. I, my, my mouth is starting to water. <laughs> okay. In this hand, I have a really beautiful, delicious-looking, red delicious apple made of plastic. From a distance, you may not be able to tell the difference, right? If I just held them up here, you, you, you may or may not be able to tell, depending on, on how well that plastic uh, fruit looked, how good it looked. But I guarantee you that once you got closer, once you held them in your hands, and once you took a bite, you'd be able to tell the difference, right? Because see, here's the thing. This fruit right here, the red, the, the, the real thing, the red delicious, the beautiful, wonderful red delicious apple that is making my mouth water currently <laughs> is naturally produced, right? Produced from nature. This is not man-made. This is produced from nature, from that seed, it's sweet, it's healthy, it's satisfying, right? That's what real fruit is. But fake fruit is synthetically manufactured. It's plastic, right? It didn't just grow, you couldn't go out in the wild and pick a plastic fruit apple. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. It's synthetically manufactured. It is not sweet. I don't know if you've ever tried to eat plastic. It's not sweet, it's definitely not healthy. It's very unsatisfying. It'd be pretty gross to eat, right? You can tell the difference between a piece of real fruit and a piece of fake fruit, a piece of plastic. You can tell the difference. And so the same, that plastic piece of fruit is the same as a life lived by the works of the Spirit. And I want to talk about that for just a second. What do you mean, Caleb? What do you mean by that? This is what I mean by that. And, and it's so very, very close. It's a very thin line. Very, we're, a lot of times this is what happens. Christians camp right here with this plastic works of the, fruit, or of the Spirit. Because they think, they read the Scripture, they read Galatians, and they read what the fruits of the Spirit are. And they look at that and they think, okay, this means that I have to have love. 
I have to have joy. I have to have peace and patience and kindness and goodness, etc., in order for me to live a life by the Spirit. The thought is that I can somehow achieve or prove that my life, I am filled with the Spirit because I walk in these things. And so it's, it's, it's so close. And you may think, are you, are you splitting hairs here? No. And here's why. Because you cannot manufacture love. You cannot manufacture peace and joy. Not like our source can. And that's why it's got to be a fruit and not a work. There is a difference. You may be able to not tell what that difference is from a distance, but I guarantee you when you bite into it, you will know the difference. This is fake. Works of the Spirit, it's, it's fake. It's not real. It's not the same. It may look the same, but I guarantee you it is not. And that is so critically important in the way that we live our lives because we have to allow the fruits to be produced within us. We are not the producers of the fruit. The fruit is produced by the Spirit of God, not us. We manufacture the horrible knockoff <laughs> that tastes just awful. That's the difference. And that's what we have to understand today, that it's specifically, Scripture specifically says, works of the flesh, fruits of the Spirit, not works of the Spirit, fruits of the flesh. And we have to understand that if we are going to live a life that is empowered, if we are going to live a life with power over chaos, we have to understand that it's not about how good a person I can be, how much I can attempt to look like Jesus myself. Please understand what I'm saying. We have to try to look like Jesus. It, it does, it's not that I, it takes no effort, okay? Please hear me right now. It's not that living a life with fruit produced by the Spirit does not take effort on my behalf. It does take effort because have you ever planted fruits? Has anybody in here ever planted anything? Okay, right? You put it in the ground. Does it automatically grow then? No, you have to cultivate it. You've got to water it. You've got to weed it. You've got to put forth effort in order to get that baby to grow so that you can see the fruits. There is effort that takes place. There is an action on our, our behalf. In order for me to see these fruits take place in my life, I have to allow the Holy Spirit to work within me, but I've got to put forth effort. But the problem is, is we get to think, I've got to put forth all this effort in order for it to be in me. And that it's my effort that is what is creating these fruits. No, your effort creates a tacky knockoff. Your works create a tacky knockoff. But the work and the fruit of the Holy Spirit, when we allow him to do the work inside of us, that's when we will begin to see the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. Amen? And here's, the, here, here's, here's something to chew on. <laughs> I wasn't actually, that was not planned. I just, <laughs> I see what I did there. By manufacturing fruit, by manufacturing works, all that is doing is modifying behavior. All we are doing, if, if my thought is, I've got to look like love. I've got to uh, have joy. I've got to have peace. I've got to have all this. I've got to be on, and, and I have to have self-control. I can manufacture my behavior. Guys, I could train a monkey to do things. That does not mean that monkey is producing the fruit of the Spirit, okay? There is a difference between manufactured works, manufactured plastic fruits, and naturally grown fruits of the Spirit that are taking place in my life. And here's the thing. I say that a lot. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. The thing is here. <laughs> Scripture tells us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if I am manufacturing fruit, if I am changing my behavior, if I'm modifying my behavior to, to try to look like the fruit, good intent, just wrong application, if I'm modifying my behavior to look like fruit, what ends up happening is when we walk through the chaos, when we walk through the storms, when these times and these trials and these things that happen in our lives that we, that we have to walk through, 
what is in here in our hearts is what comes out. So as much behavior modification as I have walked through, it doesn't matter because the root that is within me is what is going to produce the fruit that comes out of me. And if I'm not rooted in the spirit, if I'm rooted in myself, if I am rooted in, 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 in other people, if I'm rooted or in self-absorption, that is what is going to come out, not the fruit of the spirit. It's going to be a bitter tasting, cheap knockoff. And I'm going to resort back to my old self because I never allowed the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to take root within me, to, to be formed here in my heart. To, I never received it and allowed Him to do the work through me and to create and to bear that fruit within me. Behavior can be modified. A heart is not. You cannot modify your heart. You can modify your behavior. The Holy Spirit of God is who modifies your heart. And that is transformation. That's the transformation that takes place that's like when I transform from a caterpillar to a butterfly, that butterfly never goes back to the caterpillar, right? But if a caterpillar just decided to create some wings and put it on, he's not actually a butterfly. He's a cheap knockoff. And until that transformation takes place, that metamorphosis takes place in here, he will always be a caterpillar, no matter what he looks like on the outside. But when that process takes place, and when he is patient to allow that to happen, then he transforms to a butterfly, never to go back to the caterpillar. Amen? Amen. So, the big question is this. How does, how do, how does that happen? We've talked about what, you know, the difference in, in, in the works of the Spirit versus the fruits of the Spirit. So how do we allow that to happen? Yes, okay, I get it. I want, that's what I want. I want a life lived by the Spirit. I want a life that produces the fruit of the Spirit. I want that. That is what I want. How does that happen? Here we go. Let's talk about it. Talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. I need some water. <laughs> okay. Here's how it happens. The first thing listed. What was the first fruit of the Spirit? Mmm. Mm, love first. Oh, snap. God loved us so much that he sent his son. He sent his son to die for us in our place so that we could live. Man, there's no greater love than that. No greater love than a man lays down his life for another. And that's what our father did for us. He gave the life of his son. And in that, the love of God... The source, our Father, we talked about agape in our last series. If you haven't, weren't here, go check it out. It's really good. That love has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. If we have received him, if we've asked for the Holy Spirit and we received him, there's another thing we talked about was that we don't necessarily believe that it takes place at salvation. You gotta ask. But I promise you, when you do ask, he's like, I'll be there. Boom, it's that easy. So the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God could dwell anywhere, right? He's God. The Spirit of God could dwell anywhere, yet he chooses to dwell where? In us. That's very interesting. He chooses to dwell within you and I when we ask and when we receive. And I want to look at something that Jesus said in John 15. If you could turn there with me. We're going to start in verse 4. This is a familiar passage. I'm reading out of the ESV, by the way. If anybody was curious. Jesus said this in John 15. He said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. And neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do everything. Nope, not everything. You can do nothing. Apart from Jesus. And, and we talked about, and this is why this is important, that I, why I touched on this before that Jesus is saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
we believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. Amen? Okay? Apart from a life with the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. We cannot produce the fruits of the Spirit if we don't have the Spirit. That's simple, right? Makes sense. Duh. Everybody knows that. You'd be surprised. You know, actually, yesterday, let me tell you a story. Yesterday, I was, uh, it was nice outside, and we have some landscaping around the house. I've got some hydrangeas, who, which are really very beautiful. We have some crepe myrtles, which get to be extremely tall if you don't prune them. <laughs> and ours are literally above my roof. I had to do some pruning yesterday. Uh, we have some monkey grass that has grown above our fence. So needless to say, you get the picture that Caleb has not done much pruning lately at his house. Right? So I figured, hey, it's nice outside. Let's try to nip it in the bud. <laughs> there it is. I had to interject some dad humor. Okay, so anyway, I'm outside, and I decided that I'm going to trim this stuff up because it needed to be trimmed. And I'm looking at it, and a couple of them actually had started to bud on. They, 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 they had some buds that were coming out, and I'm like, man, this is kind of early, or I'm just late with <laughs> getting my trimming. Uh, unseasonably warm weather. And so I'm doing that, I'm, I'm being sure, I, you know, I don't want to cut the buds off because I, I do want the fruit or the flower. But here's the picture. I'm cutting these things down, and there's quite a lot, and I'm taking them, and I'm, I'm, I'm dragging them back. I have a, a pile over the backside of my fence, and I throw them over the fence there, and it stays in this pile. And I'm thinking about what Jesus said here, that apart from me, you're the branches, I'm the vine, and apart from me, you can't bear any fruit. And I'm looking at that, and I'm looking at all the, the, the things that I pruned before and, and thrown, uh, thrown over, and I'm, and I'm looking at that, and I'm seeing, you know what, there's, there's no life there. There's no, there's no f- flowers. There are no leaves. There's no buds. There's nothing that is, that is living there. Why is that? Why, why is it that when you cut something off of a tree, it no longer lives? Why is that? It's been cut off from its source. It has been cut off from its ability to receive nutrients, its ability to grow, its ability to, to produce. And I think that's very important. That's like the picture that Jesus is painting here. He's saying, look, if you try to live your life like these dead branches over here that have been cut off, you will not produce food, fruit. In fact, you could do nothing. But if you do not, if you're not cut off from, from me, the vine, the source, the stalk, who is rooted, who contains the nutrients for life, if you do not cut yourself off from me, then you will be able to produce much fruit, much beauty, many flowers. Amen? This is, the, this is so key. And I, I know I'm sure several of you have heard this before, and you, you, you know this picture, but it, it bears repeating that when we try to, to do these things, the, the, the works of the Spirit, on our own, we are separating ourselves from the vine that carries the nutrients and, and, and the, the ability to produce the fruit within us. By our own choices, we have separated ourselves. We say, no, I, I think I can do this on my own. I think I can work this on my own. I think I can, I, I, oh, I can, I can produce love. I can produce joy, yeah. And it's just a cheap knockoff. It's just, and, 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 and if I am a person who is starving, I'm in need of food, I'm in need of substance, I'm in need of nutrients, and I come to you, and all you do is you hand out to me a beautiful plastic apple, what the heck's that going to do for me? Besides maybe kill me if I try to eat it. Think about that. Think about yourself right now. Not in that picture. Real life. What are the fruits that I'm producing? What are the things that I'm handing out to the world who is in desperate need of nutrients, of life, of substance? Because if all I'm handing them is something that's fake and plastic, there's no reproduction in that. But if I can hand them fruit that has been cultivated, grown, watered, taken care of, and I can say, here, eat of this. Eat of this love. 
eat of this joy, eat of this peace that I have that is real and it's true. It's not fake. It will sustain you. Not by me. I just, I'm just the carrier, the producer. Let me introduce you to him. Amen? And if we want to if we want to do that, we have to allow the Spirit of God to abide within us. And we have to choose two things. Allow Him to abide within us, and we have to choose to abide in Him. There's, that, 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 that takes a responsibility and an effort on your behalf, on our behalf. And Paul says, since we live by the Spirit, let us also walk with the Spirit. It takes, it takes movement and effort. I said it a couple weeks ago. I can't, I'm not just going to stand here and open my mouth and expect words to come out of it. It's not the way the Holy Spirit works. He's not forcing it on you. Yeah, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Just thought I'd try it again. There, it, it takes an effort on our behalf and a willingness. So, point number two, fruit does not grow overnight. Has anybody planted fruit before? Did it grow overnight? No. Did you have to water it, take care of it? You had to do a lot of stuff to, to get that fruit to go. You, know, you ever plant like tomatoes and you got these little critters that decide they want those tomatoes? Not today. <laughs> <laughs> you got to take care of it, right? Protect it, grow it. The fruit of the Spirit is, is, is very similar in that it doesn't just happen overnight. Fruit is not produced overnight. I'm saying this to somebody in here today. Fruit, real fruit, is not produced overnight. Fake fruit can be. Every born again believer who has received the Holy Spirit has a seed that is planted within them. You have the capability to produce fruit. But it has to be cultivated. It has to be watered, weeded, fertilized, protected. Keep those critters out. And this is accomplished. This is how we do that. Reading the Word of God. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Building ourselves up. Our most holy faith. Praying. Maintaining relationships with other people. This is huge. This part is really big. We can't lock ourselves in our room, in my prayer closet. Great place to be. But if that's the only place I ever am, I've missed the point. Sometimes God hides things for us in other people. And that takes us going and meeting and seeing and developing relationship with other people. That's more than surface level. It's got to be deep and wide, deep and wide. Let your relationships flow deep and wide. <laughs> we also have to yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit. It takes a, a, a humility, a, a humbleness to say, lead me, Lord. You will always hear me pray that. God, whatever you want. That's what I want. Because the moment that I step into the place where I think I've got it all figured out, where, yeah, I, I know. Yeah, I know. I know what the word says. Yeah, I know. The moment I allow pride to creep in is the moment I begin to fall. But if I can maintain the right attitude, the proper attitude, if I can maintain the proper heart, that is soft and moldable and shapeable and saying, Lord, I don't have it all figured out. And I want to look like you. I want to be a man after your own heart. I want you to use me and shape me and mold me and allow the, 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 the process that takes place of producing fruit within me. I am allowing that to happen today and tomorrow and the next day because fruit takes time. It can't just be a one-time decision. We have to continue working out this salvation thing. We have to continue to work this stuff out and say, Lord, today I choose. Today I choose. Today I choose. Again, I choose 
to allow you to work within me, to produce your fruit within me. Amen? Turn to Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. I'll give you just a moment. This is just kind of a cool picture about planting and fruits and good stuff like that. It says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law. Okay, a lot of people get scared of this word law. All right, this, this is interpreted as instruction. Okay, please, please understand. His delight is in the law or instruction of the Lord. And on his instruction or law, he meditates day and night. What the Lord tells me to do, I do. And I meditate on that day and night. This is what, this is blessed is this person who does that. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Do you want that? In everything that you do, do you want to prosper? This tells us right here what that looks like. The man who, who, who meditates day and night on the instruction of the Lord, who holds it close and dear here, that man prospers. And he's like a tree that is planted. This is a cool picture because a tree that is planted is something that is intentionally done. See, trees that, are, that are, have taken root by wild, uh, all I want to say is wild oats, wild seeds, that have flown about have not been planted. They've taken root. But something that is planted is something that is intentional. And this is saying that the, the man who does these things, the man who meditates on the instruction of the Lord, has been planted by the Lord near streams of water where he can grow and he can flourish and he can produce fruit in its season. That's the kind of person, that's the man that I want to be. I hope that's who you want to be or woman. We're not gender specific. In fact, that word for man is, is, is the, the uh, word that means a, a righteous man. A righteous person does this. That's just a cool picture, I think. These trees are, are, are a representation of, the, of a believer, of someone with the Spirit, which will bear fruit in its season. As we meditate on the instruction of the Lord and as we do as he commands and as, as we allow him to, to, to work in those streams to, to fill us from the root to the fruit, from the root to the fruit, okay? Not the other way around. I don't produce the fruit, therefore I have roots. I have roots, therefore I can produce fruit. That's why it takes time. We have to be patient. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to work. And when I don't see it immediately, I can't just cast it aside. If you don't see your seed grow immediately, do you dig it up? No. If you planted a seed, you got to leave it in there. You got to keep watering it and nurturing it. And then pretty soon you see a little bit grow up and then a little bit more. And then it's, it's actually kind of big. Well, but the fruit's not there yet. Must be wrong. <laughs> no. <laughs> Any person who knows anything about anything will tell you, you got to wait. <laughs> Hold your horses. Slow your roll, big guy. Allow the cake to bake. Eh? I wish it were a cake. Fruit does not come forth instantaneously. It takes time, which requires patience, and it takes cultivation, which requires effort. Yeah. Amen? If we want the fruit to be produced in our lives, it will take an effort on our, our behalf. Plain and simple. Here's, the, here's a, another just slight, small, cool picture. You got the seed, right? You planted it in there, and you're working on it, and you're watering it, and you're fertilizing it, and you're weeding it, and then all of a sudden it starts to grow. Let me ask you this question. Did you cause it to grow? Did you cause it to grow? Did you think that you caused it to grow? You did the magic formula and now all of a sudden it's growing? <laughs> you don't cause the seeds to grow. Just like you don't cause the seeds to grow in your own life. The Holy Spirit does that. He causes it to grow. You can plant, you can water, but he is the one that causes it to increase and to grow. So don't confuse that. Think that it's all about you doing your thing. Mm -mm -mm. Don't let that pride thing creep in there. It gets you right in the bud. 
<laughs> wow, okay. Next, all right, finally this. And when we allow the producer to produce within us, this is what we will see. We will see love. Agape, unconditional, no strings attached, willful delight in others, my favorite one. A willful delight in others. You know what that means? That means it's not based on your emotions. That means I choose out of my will to love you. I love you. I love you. And I love you. Because I choose to. Not because of the way that you make me feel. It's not on my emotions. That agape love comes from our source. It is the very nature of God. Agape. God is love. He is agape. His very nature will flow out of us. What a great picture that is. And as we walk in the Spirit, God's agape, unconditional love, flows out of us. And we find ourselves loving others regardless of what they look like, regardless of who they are, and regardless of what they are. Selah. This is the kind of love that the world does not understand. But it needs it so incredibly much. Joy. Joy is not the same as happiness. Please understand, happiness is based on circumstance. You know, I got tickets to the UK game. Eee. Makes me happy. I got a hole in one. That made me happy. I got a bucket of ice cream. That really makes me happy. That's borderline joy, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> joy is based on a God who never changes. Amen. He is the source of our joy and of our strength. And as we allow the Holy Spirit to produce that within us, then our circumstances, it won't matter because I'm going to be filled with the joy of the Lord who is my strength. Regardless of what chaos I'm going through, regardless of all that stuff, it's not happiness, it's joy. Peace. We need the peace of God when we go through the storms of life. Imagine that picture of huge trees in our backyard and 100 mile an hour winds. That is a scary thought. If you think about that, if you dwell upon that, but if you have the peace of God, you can sleep like a baby like Jesus did in the middle of a storm, in the middle of a sea. That's how we're able to lay down, to play on the bed, to have fun during the middle of chaos because of the peace of God that passes all understanding. We don't understand it. And we can draw upon that with the fruit that is being produced within us. And when we do, we speak the word of God over our circumstances. Let me be very clear. This is part of that effort thing. You speak the word of God just like what happened. You speak over it and you say, no, I command you, just like Jesus did. Cease. Peace. Be still. You command it to happen. Patience or long-suffering. Does yours ever run out? <laughs> This is an area that, that can be common with most people, especially with believers. Uh, we want to serve the Lord, but we don't want to wait as he prepares us. And we need that supernatural patience that comes only from the power of the Holy Spirit. Let it produce a perfect work within you. Kindness. This simply means being nice to a person, not for gain, not for the wrong reasons, out of love and out of compassion. It means to say hello. This is practical. Practical. Are you still with me? Okay. This is practical. Kindness. Say hello to people. Excuse me. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Whatever. Look up at people. You could miss it. And kindness says hello, it smiles. It's, it's niceness, man. Be nice. Don't wait for someone else to act first. Love first. You do it first. Help somebody in need. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Mama always said. Goodness. This goes hand in hand with kindness. It's to be a blessing to others by being kind and caring and loving. Looking for the good in people. That's, 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 we talked about that a little bit. Look for the good in someone, knowing that the Holy Spirit can take care of the bad. Huh, what a good picture that is. Faithfulness means you can be counted on. 
You can be dependable. It means that you will do what you say you're going to do. Your yes is yes. Your no is no. It means that if you're married, you stay faithful to your spouse, to your family. Faithfulness. It means if you work for somebody, you're faithful to your employer. You're there. Be there. Be there and be there. You know what I'm saying? Not just show up, but be there. Be engaged. Jesus said, if someone asks you to walk a mile, walk two. Do two. Well, that just blew some people's mind right there. <laughs> what? I gotta walk miles? <sighs> I'm gonna need the power of the Holy Spirit for that. <laughs> it means you're faithful to pay your bills on time. We're talking practical, right? Simple, practical. It means... I don't know if I should go there. It means that if you're a contracted, that, here's the thing that bugs me a lot. This is a pet peeve of mine. The reputation that Christians have is that we're cheap. That we that we that we try to do the we just skate by. That we try to do the crappiest work and get the most money out of it. That's no different from the world. Come on, what what a horrible reputation that is. If we believe in a father who is who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Right? If we believe in a father who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or even think, then why is it that we think that we can go around and we can cheat people out of their money? Why is it that we can go around and we can make a commitment to go, let's say, to a school and not pay? I don't understand that. I don't understand that. Your word is your bond. And if you claim to be like Jesus, I don't see him backing out of things. He commits, and he does what he says he does because he is a faithful God. Amen. And we are created in his likeness. That means that we should be faithful people, that we will do what we say we're going to do. If I say I'm going to pay you back, I'm paying you back. Nobody wants to talk about money, right? It's that subject that's like, ooh. But here's the thing. If we believe in a God who is greater who is abundant, then this should be no thing, right? When you say, please loan me some money, I'm in need. You very, may, you very well may be in need. And very happily will you receive money. But be faithful. Be like Jesus to say, you know what? Not only am I going to pay that back, I want to bless you and I want to bless others with that too. Come up higher. Stop living over here. We're called for greater. And we're called to be a good picture to the world. And when the reputation that we have is that they're going to do cheap crap, that's a horrible reputation. And that is not a good picture of our God. All Christians are known for is asking for money. And we do. It's, I, I'm not, I mean, it's true. We do. But we have to be faithful. Be faithful to your country and pay taxes. Gentleness. Let's move on. <laughs> meekness. Gentleness also can mean meekness. This is, a, this is cool. I like this one, actually, um, because a lot of times when we think meek, we think weak. That, that's a very simple connection to make. Letting the Holy Spirit work in and through you without question is what gentleness and meekness is, without trying to reason out his purpose of leading. I got to reason this thing out. Lord, why are you having me do this? I don't understand. That doesn't make sense. Meekness. Lord, it doesn't matter. I, don't, I, I will walk through the fire and through the flames for you if that's where you have me. I will walk there willingly give myself to you. That's what meekness is. The Bible says that Moses was one of the meekest men on the face of the earth at his time, but he was not weak. Again, meek does not equal weak. It took a lot of courage to lead two and a half million complaining Jews out of Egypt. I would say that's not an easy task. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus says that he is meek, yet 
He created a whip, and he ran money changers out of his temple. Is that weak? Nope. He took on the Pharisees and the scribes, which was something that was unheard of of his day because of their influence in society and in religion. He stood up to them. He created all things. He is the king of kings, yet he humbled himself and he was born in a manger instead of a castle or a mansion. He's dying on the cross. He could have spoken one word and changed all of it, but he didn't because of the joy that was set before me, he endures the cross. He was meek, and meekness means walking. When we walk in the Spirit, we need to be submissive and not allow our ego to get in the way. That's what meekness is. Jesus did that time and time again. And finally, self-control. We all may have to bite the bullet on this one. It's because we all need to have control. But I like that it's self-control not other people control. Sometimes we have trouble controlling our tongues. Sometimes we have trouble controlling our minds, controlling our flesh, and sometimes controlling our appetites. That bucket of ice cream, man, I'm telling you. But if we do it on our own strength, we typically find ourselves out of control. If I try to have self-control, I'm going to do this, I'm going to discipline myself, and I'm going to be really good at that. (laughs) How's that working for you? Sometimes we can do it. Sometimes we can have a cheap replica knockoff. But only the Holy Spirit can bring us under control. It's only through his power that that is even uh, able to take place because he renews our minds and he helps us to remain obedient. So very important. And against all of these things, there is no such law. Are you with me this morning? Against these things, there is no such law. You can't legislate law against love and joy and peace. And by the same token, you cannot walk in the Spirit just by keeping the law. We're not under Mosaic law, but we are under the law of love. Jesus said love. Love God, love people. This is the commandment that I give to you. Love, love. This is our law. This is how we are supposed to live. And the Holy Spirit is who allows us and helps us to to, to fulfill that, to walk that out by the first fruit, which is love. Amen? Amen. To walk in the Spirit takes two things. To walk in the Spirit and its fruits takes two things. One, the leading of the Holy Spirit. And two, you being willing to be led by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Stand with me. We're not going to sing this morning. We're just going to pray. I think that we should remember why fruit is made. Consider why fruit is made. Why do we have fruit? To be eaten. Fruit is produced so that way we can eat it. And it's not just to satisfy our own hunger but for the hunger of those around us. The world is starving, guys. The world is starving for the fruit that is the Spirit, amen? And they're starving for joy and for love and for peace, for patience, for kindness. The world is starving for goodness. It's starving for faithfulness and gentleness, meekness, long-suffering, self-control. The world is starving for these things. And when we, when we allow the producer to produce these fruits within us because we are connected with the vine and we abide in him, then we will begin, our lives will begin to produce the fruits of the spirit so that the world can take and eat and be satisfied and begin to continue to produce and to reproduce and to reproduce. Amen? Amen. And in the end, all of that is so that God can get the glory. All of this is not just so that I can be an awesome person and have great, a great fruit stand coming out of me. It's so that our Lord gets all the glory. Because it, again, remembering, it is He who causes this thing to grow. It is He who brings forth the fruit in our lives. Amen?
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you. Thank you so much for, for, for being our God, for being the, the, the life giver that you are, for being the producer that you are, and for allowing us to be a part of you, to be, to be, to be one with you. We want you we desire that you abide within us and that we abide within you. And today we make that choice and we say, today I choose, say with me today, today I choose to follow you, to allow you to have rule in my life. Today I choose to have a humble heart so that you can shape it to look like you. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We receive it today. We receive what we ask. We receive what we pray, and we believe that that transformation is taking place even right now. From caterpillars to butterflies, Lord, that we look like you, that we produce your fruit, and that that fruit in turn reproduces itself in others in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we thank you for your power the Holy Spirit, allowing us to walk through the chaos of life. We thank you, Holy Spirit.